If we go back to Saturday, March 29th, 1975, Sharon Pryor left home at 7.15 p.m. and walked on Congregation Street in Pointe saint charles Around the same time, at 7.20 p.m., on Ash Avenue, a young woman named Cheryl Hua is assaulted. The man is Anglophone. He comes up behind her and puts a knife against her throat. Then he tells her, in English, to follow him. She tries to fight him off, to defend herself, but at the same time, a group of young people are walking down the street and see them. We believe that he ran away down the side streets and came face to face with Sharon, who was going to the pizzeria. So he followed the same route to the pizzeria. It coincides? Yes, with the time. For us, it seems very likely there is a link. Was Cheryl able to describe him? Yes. Do we have it? In the police report of Cheryl Roy's complaint is the description of this individual. According to the report, he was pretty tall. It says six feet. He was about 28 with blue eyes, a mustache, and light brown hair. The description is rather interesting. The description that seemed pretty simple in 1975 is now very important in 2022. We can't rely on it 100 percent, but it's a great basic clue to select suspects. The first thing I noticed in the investigation was in the file, there was a phenotyping report from an American laboratory. A phenotyping report consists of establishing the profile of a person as well as his physical characteristics through DNA. We get a physical description, a sketch of what the suspect looked like at the time of the events in 1975. It's like a projection of his physical appearance. What motivates us is to know we can make a difference. Whether it's cold cases or current cases, we know that thanks to our scientific expertise, we can guide investigations. Above all, we can help the legal system to give answers to the families. I'm Nicolas Tremblay, a forensic biologist at the Forensic Science Medicine Laboratory of Quebec. Is it 100% accurate? Genetic profiling is about probabilities. Often we'll be able to tell with high probability what is not part of the profile. With a blonde individual, if we test their hair, we'll be able to say that there's more than a 99% chance that the hair isn't black, brown or red. So in terms of hair color, it could be blonde, or light brown. That is the power of genetic profiling. We can say what it is not. And since there aren't 150 different hair and skin colors, it gives a pretty good idea of the profile. Regarding crime solving, DNA has been used ever since there's been technology allowing us to investigate it. When we do a genetic sketch, we also get the information for genetic genealogy. We take one million different measurements in the DNA, and then we upload them to a public database to check if some people have published their genetic profiles, and if we can find a match. If I commit a crime and my genetic genealogy is profiled, they will find a second cousin in my family tree. We transfer the information to genealogists who will check the public databanks. His job is to find the common ancestors in these family trees and to give the investigator the family trees that converge on potential suspects. It has been demonstrated in the United States that if 1 to 3 percent of the population is tested and the results are put in banks, we will have a high enough match to be sure we can target the family of that individual. 
It's amazing. We have much more than a police sketch. We uploaded his DNA in American genetic genealogy banks to try and find matches. In this case, in addition to the unknown genetic profile, we have the sequence of the Y chromosome. What is particular with the Y chromosome is that we inherit it identically from our father, our grandfather, and our great-grandfather. Thanks to the Y chromosome, we can trace a paternal lineage. So, if I have a brother, he has the exact same Y chromosome as my father and my grandfather. So the Y chromosome is specific and identical among the men of the same paternal lineage. At this moment, almost at the same time, I submitted to our laboratory in Montreal a new exhibit from the crime scene that had not been analyzed, Sharon Pryor's pants. Pants were found next to her body, but the suspect had taken them off. The only DNA we had had already been used for the phenotype profiling. Every time we analyze DNA, we lose some of it. DNA cannot be reused. It's like putting it in a fire. When it's consumed, it can't be reused. The fact that you kept the evidence allows you to collect DNA today. If there is a good amount of DNA on a well-preserved garment, we can collect it and analyze it. It's as if the crime happened a few months ago. Indeed, the killer's profile was found on the pants. The same profile was found on the victim's underwear, as well as on the man's shirt that served as a constraint. We took that sample and sent it to another laboratory that uses other DNA databanks. A name came up. This gave us the last name for our investigation. But since 1975, no one had ever mentioned this name. And I thought, that's why we've been chasing a ghost all this time. My job was to work hard to find that person. Is he part of the population? Does he live in Pointe Saint-Charles? Is the name in police databases? I need to find matches for his name. This investigation has led me to a person whom I tracked down in Montreal, next to Pointe Saint-Charles. He had a criminal record. So he could really fit the profile of our suspect. First, he's an American citizen. He isn't Canadian. Second, if this is our suspect, this American citizen is now deceased, buried in the United States. This information is interesting on several levels. Enough to visit the prior family to inform them of this new lead in the investigation. It's probably the best lead we've had since 1975. Hi, Mrs. Hello. Pryor. Hi. Hello. How's it going? Hi. So we're going to take a little bit of a, yes, your please. time again? You. Yep. Thank All right. You. Your mother is here? Yes, she is. All right. She's right here. Hi, Mrs. Pryor. Hello. How yes, are you Mr. Today? Eric. How are you doing? Yeah, do you remember me? Yeah, I do. Eric. Eric. We're going to give you news about the case again. OK. We're still on the same good lead. And uh, that's why uh, we want you guys to be part of it. OK? So as you may remember, it's a US citizen, OK? Yep. He, uh, he comes from a family of eight children. Four of them are male. Uh, among the, the male, two are still alive. One of them is in Florida States, and the other one is in West Virginia, OK? Uh, about the two dead ones, our main suspect the one that uh, we found traces of him in Montreal area is the one that is uh, now uh, in a graveyard site in West Virginia. That one died uh, at 36 years old in 1982. So in 1975, he was 28 years old. Oh, he was 28. He was 28. 28. By the way, 28. Yeah. As you may remember, he's also the exact same age as the suspect in Cheryl assault. You remember yeah. that? Yes. I still have the report with me, so that fits perfectly.
the descriptions also fits. Like, they can't be two yeah. at one time, and yeah. a matter of half an hour. And then, and you cannot give any names right now? No, nothing. Not yet. I, I, I can't wait to tell you guys his name. But his name was never brought up by anyone since 1975. We need to get the DNA of the two brothers in the United States. Then we'll compare it with our suspect's DNA, which is the DNA found at the crime scene. We contacted the FBI, and with their consent, we managed to get the help of local police forces where the suspect's brothers live. So we got in touch with Sarasota's police department in Florida and Huntington's police department in West Virginia. We asked them to collect the brothers' DNA and told them how to do it. And we're waiting for the results. Coming up... It was always on my mind, who killed Sheriff? Can old bones break a cold case? The profile from the bones yeah. is a full match when W5 continues. Bureau des enquêtes, ça change Detective Rasico? Le colis est arrivé? OK, parfait, je m'en viens. OK, c'est bon, merci. We have just received the DNA sample from West Virginia. It belongs to one of the brothers. So we will take the sample and leave it as it is, in the box, and we'll bring it today to the Forensic Science and Medicine Laboratory in Montreal so that it can be analyzed and compared to the killer's DNA found at the crime scene. We will analyze the DNA of both brothers. If the results are positive, we will be able to say that there is a link with their killer. This link will give us grounds to request the exhumation of the killer. Can you see and hear me well? This is the sample from one of the brothers from the Huntington Police Department in West Virginia. I already received it. I'll get the other one this week. Last week, we received, as well, his full criminal record. Mm -hmm. And also his full prison records. What's in the prison records? The prison records are rather magical because we have access to a large bank of information on all his incarcerations and his behavior within the prison walls. It's really huge. There are many charges and different types of charges, too. He started his criminal career at age 11. Are there any crimes that resemble the crime you're investigating? Oui. I would assume that if he was imprisoned in 1975, you would know it. We looked into it, but that isn't the case. Okay. We also discovered that, on several occasions, he was in the Montreal region in Canada. While we know he's an American who crossed the border many times, there are still many unanswered questions. It, it's like a puzzle. We're trying to find as many pieces as possible in order to get a full picture. Because what the family feared the most was that the killer was a member of the community that they mix with on a regular basis and still do today, but without knowing who it was. So we want to give them as many answers as possible. In order to do that, we need to perform a classic investigation, which takes a long time, too. We've got big news uh, today for you guys. So uh, we were waiting for the results, and uh, I've got it with me right okay. now. Okay, great. There, there's a match. So what I mean by that is what it's uh, so uh, good. 
that we can say that uh, there's 140 million more chance that, is... that it is one of their brother instead of anyone else. Okay. okay. Oh. So it's very good. It's that strong. So we're very, very close to an end. First of all, the two brothers have the same Y chromosome as the killer. But neither of these two men is the killer. The killer is one of their brothers. Let me uh, do a little recap about uh, the meeting uh, with the two brothers when we, uh, we went there to get a DNA sample, okay? Let's talk about the first one, the one uh, in Florida State. He said right away that he wasn't surprised that he could be uh, involved in it, right away. So uh, why is that? Because he said he's a violent man. And the other one said um, the same thing. He said he probably did it. While he was stationed at Okinawa in Japan with the Marine Corps over there, the main suspect tried to rape his wife. Uh, you do know that he was in jail for rape too, but again, he hated him. I'm glad he's dead. Yeah. I won't tell anybody else. Exactly. He, he, he was dangerous. Yeah. Real dangerous. Speaking to the police officers in Sarasota and Huntington gave us a lot of additional information. They described him as a very violent man. One of them even said he wouldn't be surprised if he had killed someone else. We're working right now for the next part of our investigation, which is the exhumation. Yeah. Eric, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I was uh, unable to... Uh, put him uh, handcuffs, but yeah, at least you will have some answers. So... Uh, and it'll be 48 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we'll see. We hope that the DNA we collect from the killer's corpse upon exhumation will allow us to prove once and for all that he is responsible for Sharon Pryor's murder. It'll also give the family a final answer about the killer's identity. Excited to be here. We come a long way. Finally, be able to resolve it and for the family. It's uh, it's very exciting as well. Our main suspect is being exhumed today. We've worked on this for so many weeks, it really feels like an accomplishment. West Virginia State Police Forensic Department is here to help. They are being assisted by our biologist who will take the samples. Basically, she will take what she needs to profile his DNA. The machine has been digging for 20 minutes. They just realized the grave is in a bad state. It's made of steel, and they're trying to find a way to get the coffin out without damaging it. There are a lot of people right now. A security perimeter is there to prevent them from approaching. We let Eric work because it's the culmination, or at least an important and stressful step. The biologist is working inside the grave. From what I understand, she needs to take bones. Five bones. So the mandible, the femur, for example. Places where she knows she can find the DNA. First, we'll go to the FBI office here in Huntington so that we can clean the samples with water, 
before putting them in exhibit bags that will be sealed. When the exhibits arrive in Montreal, I'll bring them myself to the Forensic Science Laboratory in Montreal, where a biologist will be expecting us. She will then extract the DNA and analyze it. I have just received a phone call from the biologists at the forensic lab. They informed me that they obtained a complete profile from the bones we ourselves procured during the exhumation. They even had enough time to compare that profile with the profile of the killer on the scene. And today, we have a result that we can share with the Pryor family. Franklin Maywood Romine is an American with a long judicial history. He has many priors. We're talking at least about 13 criminal convictions. This individual kept crossing the border. Whenever he felt the police were on his heels, he'd go across the border. At this time, we are aware of at least four people who were raped. And at this very moment, we are checking the possibility that he may have committed other crimes of the same nature, both in Canada and in the United States. So at 1.40 this afternoon, yeah. I received a phone call from our biologist. Okay. First, uh, they have a complete profile from the bones. The, the second thing is that the profile from the bones yeah. is a full match with the one from the crime scene that wow. belongs to the murderer. Wow. So it's in. It's really in without any doubt. Without doubt. Oh, wow. It's loud and clear. Beautiful. Yeah, it's him. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy, but I'm crying. Yeah. Yeah. If you need anything. <laughs> 48 years journey. Sharon is yeah. guided, Mommy. <laughs> it was always on my mind, who killed Sharon? Who killed her? And we always thought maybe it was somebody in Verdun or in the Point, but it's not, which is good, which is good. They got him. I felt like we were relieving a great weight from their shoulders. Let me tell you, it is very emotional. These are extraordinary women. They spent their whole lives trying to solve this crime. Throughout my career, I worked on many stories of unsolved murders, of disappearances, and often people lose hope, unfortunately. But this case, the Sharon Pryor case, I believe will restore hope to so many families who are seeking, who are in the dark today, because maybe, finally, the answer is out there somewhere. I hope that from now on, Sharon will be able to rest in peace. Rest in peace That's my yeah. only wish for her right now. Yeah. The DNA of Sharon Pryor's killer has been sent to databanks across the U.S. to see if he's linked to any other crimes. 